Well, today we got something special going on around here. Uh, we're going to be having today here, right now, an ordination service for Richie Danielson. Where is Richie? There he is. So Richie has been a, a long-term member of this church, a missionary, uh, right now a hospice chaplain. He's finished up a Bible college degree. He's finishing up a, a MDiv degree. And so today we're going to be formally ordaining him to pastoral ministry. And we'll do that a little later in the service. We'll come up and pray for him. And then after this service, we are going to have a potluck in the gym. You are all invited uh, to join us for that. If, even if you didn't bring anything, it's okay. We forgive you. Full of grace. Join us for lunch. Now, we ordered you two cakes, Richie, all right? So we're going to have two cakes in there. As we were discussing these cakes in the office the other day, uh, Amanda, who heads things up for us in the office, she said, well, listen, I, I got one cake with white frosting and one cake with chocolate frosting. And both of them have both chocolate and vanilla swirled on the inside. So the idea here is no one's going to be able to avoid one or the other. None of this, I want chocolate, one I want white. But we do have white frosting on one and cho- chocolate frosting on one. So I said, what we should do, and then we said, what should we put on the cakes? And I said, oh, what we should do is say, Richie, right on there, Richie, this dark chocolate represents the dark times in ministry that you're going to have, the struggles, the trials. And on the white one, we can say, this cake will represent the joys and the wonderful moments you'll have in ministry. So we didn't write that on there. We just said, congratulations, Richie. But Richie, this is the symbolic meaning of these cakes, okay? Because the reality is, if you go out as a pastor or a hospice chaplain, boy, you're going to have moments where you're living on top of the world. You feel like the Lord is with you and helping you. You're going to have other seasons of probably profound darkness and struggle. And look, this is true not only of pastoral ministry. This is true of any job you have, probably. This is true of our experience in life in probably every different aspect. Sometimes things are going well, and there are delightful things, and we're just happy and satisfied, and there are moments and times and valleys of life where it just seems like everything is dark and there's no hope. So we all get the chocolate and the vanilla. From this illustration, can you tell which one I prefer? Vanilla. Well, um, normally when you do an ordination service, you pick some Bible passage that speaks directly to pastoral ministry and you use that text. And I was going to do that. But then I noticed as we're going through this series we've called Promise of the Risen King, tying up the end of the book of Acts and beginning the, sorry, the end of the book of Luke and getting into the book of Acts, I noticed that the next passage in line was the story of the early church replacing Judas, who had failed and fallen from the apostolic ministry with uh, an apostle to replace him. I said, you know what? We can massage that. We can draw out some themes related to Richie's ordination. So today we're going to look at this next passage as we finish Acts chapter 1. And we're going to look at this passage through two lenses. One lens is going to be, okay, what does it say to all of us as believers faced with the ups and downs and trials in life? But also we're going to look through the lens of what does this passage also say specially to uh, Richie this morning as we formally acknowledge God's call in his life and set him apart to ministry. So in this passage, we're going to see three snapshots of God accomplishing his purposes in the early church, even despite tragedy, suffering, and evil. We're going to see that God gets done what he needs to get done even though we go through both seasons of experience. So I hope you got a bulletin when you came in. You can pull that out and look at our passage. Those of you online can download a PDF and follow along there. So here's part one. We're going to start in Acts chapter 1, verse 12. In part one of this passage, I'm calling God's people obedient, united, prayerful. Here's the snapshot we're given of the early church just after Jesus' ascension. This is verse 12. The apostles returned to Jerusalem, from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. Godly Jews were only supposed to walk a certain distance on the Sabbath, like three quarters of a mile. So here it's just saying, look, where they were on the Mount of Olives was within a mile of the city. And what we saw last week was they went out there on the mountain and they saw Jesus. Well, he said goodbye to them. He raised his hand in blessing and Jesus was taken up and was hidden from them in a cloud. This is Jesus' ascension, his triumphant return to heaven after his resurrection. So now they come back to the city. Verse 13, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. There's a whole little mystery wrapped up in this reference to the room they were staying. We see a variety of references in the Gospels and the book of Acts, multiple times to an upper room, a room where they were staying. Look on the screen. Here's the different passages. Uh, Where they have the Last Supper. Um, Where they do what we see happening today. Uh, Where they meet later. 
Now, it's a little unclear. Are this the same room or different rooms? What's most interesting is the last reference there in Acts 12. This upper room is said to be in the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, the guy who ends up writing the Gospel of Mark. Now, uh, we're going to see in a little bit, there's 120 people or so gathered in this upper room. Now, an upper room in the architecture and the way you build houses in those days is one of two things. It's either the upper floor, like the second story of a house, where on the main floor you'd keep like your animals and your livestock. The main living area would be upstairs on the second floor. Alternatively, this upper room can refer to a, a room built on the roof of that second floor, often accessible by a stairway on the outside. And if you go to Jerusalem, they found ruins in what's called the upper city of big houses like this. Now notice, if this room is holding how many people? 120. This has got to be a pretty big room, which means this has got to be the home of someone fairly wealthy. And there's homes of this size there in the upper city of Jerusalem. Now, Christian tradition went on to say all of these events happened in the same place, and it really was the mother of John Mark. So you can go visit Israel today, and you can visit a church built over this spot. It's called the Kenical. I forget what that means. Here's a picture of it. And, but we don't know for sure if this is the place. However, it is interesting. We have a Palestinian Christian writer named Epiphanius of Salamis. He writes in 394. And he says that back in the year 130, when the Roman emperor Hadrian came to look at the destruction of Jerusalem that had happened after the second Jewish revolt in the second century, it says that the whole city was destroyed except for a small church which had been built where the disciples had gone to the upper room after the ascension. So this is a very old Christian memory that this was the spot, though of course we can't uh, be sure. Look what Luke says who is present. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So here we see a list of the 11 apostles that are left after Judas's uh, defection. Now, Luke, in his Gospel and Acts, has a special interest in women. He highlights them more than any other Gospel writer, and you can see that he's at pains when he can to present pairs of men and women following Jesus together. So no surprise here. We see the list of the male disciples, but we also see highlighted some of Jesus' female followers. Here first called the women. What women? Probably the women he's just talked about in Luke that have been witnesses to the resurrection. But of course, we see a reference here to Jesus. And notice the interesting last four words. And with his brothers. You know, Jesus had brothers. James is most famous of these. He goes on to be the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Not the apostle James, but James, the brother of the Lord, who writes the book of James in the Bible. And Christians have often been divided on who exactly these brothers are. Um, probably the most common Christian view is that these were Joseph's sons from a previous marriage. So these were actually Jesus' half-brothers. Because the traditional Christian view is that Mary remained a virgin after she got married to Joseph and never had more children. On the other hand, many Christians will say, no, this looks like an easy reference to normal uh, brothers. And so these are very plausibly children that Mary and Joseph have together. Though either way, these are half-brothers of Jesus because Joseph was not Jesus' biological father. But notice, Jesus' family is very involved in the early church, and here we see some of Jesus' own brothers now assembled with this group of the first Christians. But none of those things are the emphasis here. Notice the emphasis here is on what everyone's doing. Jesus had told them at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts to wait in Jerusalem until... God gave the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were to wait until they receive this empowerment before they go out and do what they do next. So notice what it says here. They all join together constantly in prayer. So prayer is talking to God, praising God, um, being silent, focusing our thinking on God, uh, worshiping God. And I'll tell you what, if we had to peg like the most essential spiritual practice, if we had to highlight the most important spiritual discipline. It is likely this idea of prayer. Life lived with God, in the presence of God, asking him for help, seeking his favor, praising him, thanking him for things. Here is the essential response to God, that of prayer. Okay, so I have a few things on your outline specifically to you, Richie. 
A few things we can draw out from this passage uh, that I think God is calling you to as you are continuing down this path of following him. So I put this, first of all, Richie, devote yourself to prayer. And I know this is something you already do because you are out there as a minister. He is a hospice chaplain. That means he is a shepherd to the dying. His job is to accompany people in their last stages of life. And so for this to work, you need God's power. You need God's presence. And so we encourage you, Richie, to keep up these practices that you already have, devoting yourself to prayer. Paul says in somewhere in 1 Corinthians, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And you know, Richie, you want God's power in your ministry. So we encourage you, all of us, continue to devote yourself to prayer like we see here in this model of the early church. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. But the rest of us aren't off the hook because notice it's not just the apostles here seen devoting themselves to prayer. It's all the followers of Jesus together. And so here's an opportunity for us to reflect on our own practice, our own life. Okay, are we satisfied with the amount of time that we are carving out in our busy schedules to seek the Lord and to pray? Are we where we want that to be? If not, here's an opportunity to reassess and to restructure our lives so that we can live out this most essential response to Jesus. Okay, let's look at part two of this passage. Putting it this way, God's purposes advancing despite evil. Here's what we really see in this passage. God's purposes is advancing despite evil. Verse 15, in those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. There's where we get that size. And he said, brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. Now, you and I are so used to the story of Jesus being crucified. We're so used to the story of Judas betraying Jesus that I I suspect the story has very little punch for us. And we forget and we miss how shocking, how tragic, how horrifying an experience this must have been for the first followers of Jesus. I mean, Judas was one of the core guys. He was one of the 12, handpicked by Jesus. Apparently, there was nothing about Judas that raised red flags because the Gospel of John tells us Judas had been in particular charge of the money bag and their finances, and you're not going to give that job to somebody who you're suspicious of. So to all accounts, Judas was a godly follower of Jesus. We presume then he went out and he performed healings. We, We suppose he drove out demons like everybody else. If he hadn't, he would have looked suspicious. So here was an insider, someone handpicked by Jesus, and he turned out to be a complete traitor, betrayed Jesus to his death. And so what's happening here is the church is reeling in the aftermath of this evil turn of events, this tragic disaster that was a contributing factor to Jesus' death. Now, of course, the resurrection has now turned the whole escapade around, but they still have to deal with part of the fallout of Jesus, of sorry, Judas's departure and betrayal. So, how does the early church, how does Peter and the apostles, how do they handle this tragedy and this evil? Well, unsurprisingly, they turn their eyes to the scriptures, to the Bible. We'll look at that in a moment. First, notice how Peter views the scriptures. Look at verse 16. He says, The scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David. So what two influences do we see there on the Bible? What two agents are responsible for the production of the scripture according to Peter? Who wrote it? This verse he's going to go on to talk about. David, right? So there's the human author, but notice what else Peter says. This was done through the guidance, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so this is our view of scripture along with Peter. That what we have in the Bible is on one hand a very human book in that it is written by people. Okay, we see different personalities, different styles, different experiences. But at the same time, we believe the scripture is actually guided in its production by the Holy Spirit. So just like we believe that Jesus is both fully human and fully divine in one per- person, so too we believe that the scripture is both fully human and fully divine in one product. So it's written by people, but because of that inspiration of the Spirit, it is also the word of God. It is what God wanted them to write down precisely for us as well as them. Notice this is Jesus' view as well. Look at this verse out of Mark 12. This doesn't surprise us because this was the godly Jewish person's view of the scriptures. So Jesus, as a Jewish prophet at least, 
that, though, of course, much more. Look at Mark 12, 36. Jesus said, about to quote one of the Psalms, David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared. So notice Jesus holds the same view. So I suggest to you, this is why we should accept the Scripture as from God. It's because this was Jesus' view. And if we are followers of Jesus, we are going to take his word for it, and we will put the same trust and confidence in the Scriptures that we see Jesus himself advocating for. Okay, so for us, if the most primary, most central spiritual practice is prayer, talking to God, opening ourselves to God in that way, if we say that's number one, absolutely a close second is going to be life with the Scriptures. If prayer is us speaking to God, us turning to the Scriptures is looking at what God has spoken to us, and there's more going on there than just reading a book. Because this is inspired by God, God is able to use the Scriptures to grow us and challenge us spiritually that are absolutely essential for who we want to be, and who God is calling us to be. So, Richie, we want you to maintain a high view of Scripture. Okay, we are ordaining you and setting you apart as a leader of the church broadly. And so people are going to be looking to you. What does the Bible say about this? What does God say about this? And so you're in a position to be able to speak and teach and guide based on God's Scripture. So we encourage you to hold on to the high view of Scripture that you do have, believing these things. And notice we believe that the scriptures are not only inspired, meaning they came from God, but we also believe that the scriptures are what we call are inerrant. This means when rightly understood, all right, and when we account for things like genre, and we look at the purposes for which the scriptures are given, there are no mistakes, no errors in it. Now, this is a theological belief about the Scripture from the top down based on what we believe about God. We believe God is powerful. We believe God tells the truth. And so we believe the Bible is inerrant. And when rightly understood, is no mistakes or errors because this is what God's revelation would be. Now, I freely admit we cannot prove this from the bottom up, okay? I mean, we've got some difficult questions that we may not have iron-tight answers to. Those things that have survived from antiquity in terms of history and archaeology are largely random and incomplete. And so as we look at what we find from history compared to the Bible, there are some places where we're like, I don't know exactly what's going on here. That looks like a problem. Now, there are plausible suggestions that have been made for all such problems, but not in every case are we able to prove it. Okay, But what inerrancy says, we believe that at the end of the day, once all the facts are known, the scriptures will have been shown to be without contradiction, without problem, or without error. But again, we cannot necessarily demonstrate that. So, Richie, we urge you to maintain this high view of Scripture and to go out and bring God's Word to the people that need to hear it. Agreed? All right. What else do we want to say? Well, we get a little little sidetrack here about Judas. Look at verse 18. Luke is going to explain to us what happened to Judas after his defection. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Wow. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. So they called that field in their language, Akel Dama, that is, field of blood. Now, actually, here's one of those Bible problems I mentioned to you. Because when you look at this account of what happened to Judas and lay it alongside what the Gospel of Matthew says happened to Judas, this looks like a kind of contradiction. Let me show you what I mean. Here's Matthew 27 out of the Gospel of Matthew. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I've sinned, he cried, for I've betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, it's against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set in him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. So you lay those two together, it looks like a contradiction, all right? In Luke, Judas is the one who buys the field. In Matthew, it's the priests that buy the field. In Luke, Judas falls down and bursts open like a hand grenade. And in Matthew, he hangs himself. Well, how do we wrestle with this tension? Well, first of all, notice the main gist of both stories is the same, isn't it? I mean, it really is. Like the punchline, this story has the same core, 
And so this actually matches a description of what scholars have observed what happens in an oral culture, a culture like the ancient Middle East where people pass on stories orally. The way this model of transmission usually works is there is a stable core to the tradition that's passed on, but in every telling there's some variation in details. And so it's very interesting to observe when we look at the Gospels, when we see the same story recorded more than once, usually what we see is a stable core, but some variation in detail. And so this is why it's important to remember, when we're thinking about inerrancy, we have to also pay attention to genre, what type of writing this is. We have to allow the Gospels to operate as they actually operate, not like we would expect them to operate. And so in the ancient world, the genre that the Gospels fit best is biography. Not like a modern biography, but ancient biography. And people in writing ancient biography at times felt somewhat free to paraphrase, rearrange things, to draw out whatever purposes and points they wanted to highlight. And so our view is that God inspired these authors to bring out these different emphases for their own purposes. So, does that mean the Bible is wrong and in error when a story like this is presented in different ways? Not necessarily. No, absolutely not. For example, notice even in this case, one story says Judas bought it with the money, the other story says the priests bought it. Well, you can see if the priests used Judas's money to buy it, in a certain sense, you can say, well, Judas bought it. It was his money after all. And look, one story says he hung himself, and one story says he fell down and his body burst open. Those seem contradictory. Are they absolutely? Not necessarily. Oftentimes what we find in the recording of history, particular oral history, is that the real events are often very complex. And sometimes when a person draws out aspects of that story to tell a different account, it can end up looking contradictory. For example, interesting account of this, uh, I read a terrible story about a lynching that happened in 1881 where somebody was hung. And there were different accounts of this story. Some people said the people were hung from a railroad crossing. Other stories said, no, the people were hung from a pine tree. The question is, well, this is a contradictory story. What's right? And then historians found photographs of the same poor people hung in both places. They'd been hung in one place, taken down, and hung in the other place. So notice the actual chain of events was more complicated, but in each telling, people had brought out details which made it look contradictory. So could it be that Judas hung himself, his body wasn't discovered for a couple days in the warm climate, and stuff burst? Could be. So again, from our opinion, it's, it's wise to withhold judgment. We believe when all the facts are known, the scriptures will be shown to be without error, uh, but we don't have all the facts. And we won't necessarily until the Lord comes back. Well, it's a strange passage for Richie for his ordination service here. Um, let's ask this. How could it be that God allowed something terrible to happen like Judas' betrayal? I mean, there's kind of what they're wrestling with today. How could this be? Well, Peter looks at the scripture. So look what he says in verse 20. For Peter said, it was written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, that's Psalm 69, 25, let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership, Psalm 109, 8. Now, if you go back and look at those, those don't look like they're talking about Judas betraying Jesus. So we scratch our heads. But we got to realize there are two different ways that we see the writers of the New Testament using Old Testament verses. Sometimes it's a very clear prediction that is fulfilled, like Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, do, 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 Jesus is born in Bethlehem. But more commonly, the way the New Testament writers write about fulfillment of the Old Testament is they look back at the Old Testament and they see a pattern. Here's what happened to God's people back then. And they see that pattern now repeated in Jesus' life, usually with a kind of escalation, and they say, see, that fulfilled it. And that's the kind of fulfillment that we have here. The early church and Peter are wrestling with this betrayal. How do we process this? They look to the scriptures, and they see a couple psalms written by David about a righteous sufferer who experienced betrayal and prayed for vindication from his enemies. I say, wow, look at this. That happened to David. Now here is David's descendant, the great Messiah, and notice how this even happened to Jesus. But now those enemies are going to meet judgment. So we see a final kind of fulfillment as Jesus repeats so many Old Testament patterns. And so this helps us process things like betrayal. That says to Peter, look, back there with David, there was betrayal of godly people going on, and God's purposes stood. 
Those enemies that attacked David ended up being thwarted. Well, look, Jesus' enemies are going to be thwarted. Yes, there was betrayal, there was suffering, but God's purposes are going to stand. And so Peter sees in this passage guidance. Look, we need to replace Judas. So side note to you, Richie, let's put it this way. Beware temptation to sin and apostasy. Apostasy is a fancy word that means abandoning Christianity, abandoning faith in Jesus. And I think Judas is a sober warning to you and I and to all of us. Here's a guy that seemed like an insider. Here's a man who seemed like a sincere follower of Jesus, yet it was revealed that he was, as Jesus called him somewhere, a devil. And so, look, we, we recognize our frailty. You put any of us in the wrong situations, crosswire something in our mind, any of us are capable of anything. So let us take a sober warning, Richie. We want to hold fast and seek after the Lord, looking neither to the right nor the left, being aware of temptation, and particularly the great temptation of abandoning Jesus. May it never be. Agreed? Yeah. Again, a strange passage for an ordination service, but fitting perhaps to us. Verse 20 before there, sorry, 21. Therefore, it's necessary to choose one of the men who've been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, a beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they need to restore the number of 12 apostles. There's only 11. And it's fairly clear to see the reason why Jesus picked 12 apostles was to symbolize Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. And the symbolic point seemed to be that faithful Israel was now being reoriented around Jesus. What determined your faithful response to God now was going to be your response to Jesus. Interesting, notice Jesus did not place himself as one of the 12, did he? He could have been descended from David. He could have been representing the tribe of David. But we see Jesus as the leader outside the 12 tribes. Kind of in whose position? God. Just another little casual thing. Okay, so notice, Judas does not need to be replaced because he died. We know this because later in the Gospel of Acts, the Apostle James will die and he's not replaced. So the Apostles do not just keep getting replaced as they die out. Rather, Judas needs to be replaced because of his betrayal. He was a traitor. And so the 12th Apostle needs to be put into that position. So verse 3, sorry, part 3, put it this way. God's pastors, chosen and recognized. Now, the apostles are not called pastors here, but that starts with a P, and I needed three Ps for the different points. You see, sometimes we got to twist things a little bit, Richie, to, for good alliteration. But look, pastor means shepherd, and so the apostles are pastors. They are capital S shepherds. I mean, these are the shepherds and pastors of the early church. And so look how this goes here. Verse 23. So they nominated two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left us to go where he belongs. Where was that? No, we're good. 26. Then they cast lots, kind of like rolling dice or pulling out a sticks or something. And the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. Now notice they found two qualified people and said, all right, Lord, just choose between these two. It wasn't like they took everyone's name and just drew one randomly. So this is not, this is not how you want to just pick leaders for anything from a huge pool, but it could be a practical way. Look, if you've got two good candidates and it's unclear which one, well, let's roll dice and trust that the Lord causes that to fall where it will. So, Richie, let's put it this way to you. Remember your call to ministry and our confirmation of it. That's what we're doing up here in part. Uh, Richie had to go through a process. He had to write a paper where he laid out all of his different theological beliefs. And then he had to come in with the elders, and we had an oral examination, what, for an hour, hour and a half. And we just peppered the poor guy with questions to see how he could think on his feet. And he had to talk about his call to ministry. Um, why is he following this path? What does he believe? And so, so what we're doing today is, is not automatic. We ran him through a rigorous process of examination. And so what we're doing as a church is wholeheartedly uh, recognizing uh, God's call to ministry on Richie's life and confirming that. So hopefully, Richie, you'll be able to look back on this day. We have a certificate for you. You'll have some pictures. You'll be able to look back and say, okay, I remember this. That church recognized God's call in me and set me apart and devoted me to this ministry. So bottom line for us, looking at this passage as a whole, let's put it this way. Drive forward towards God's purposes despite evil and hardship. Drive forward towards God's purposes despite evil and hardship. We see the church having to pick up the pieces here of Judas's betrayal. 
But Peter looks at the scripture. He says, look at this pattern. This is what happens to God's people. It's going to be okay. And let's see who God has for us to fill this spot. So three suggestions. First, by devoting yourself to obedience, unity, and prayer. We see an idealistic snapshot of the early church, all gathered together, praying together, obediently as they wait for the gift of the Spirit. Luke surely presents this as a model for us to follow as followers of Jesus. Second, by trusting that God knows and accounts for life's evils. As Peter wrestled with the loss of Judas, he looked back at the Old Testament scriptures and he saw guidance in the Psalms from David's experiences that spoke right into this tragedy and disaster and assured Peter that what happened was not unknown to God but had been accounted for. So it was going to be okay. Third, by faithfully following God's calling on your life. And look, God calls all of us primarily to himself, secondarily to some role of service as his follower. And whatever that looks like for you, the Lord asks you and expects you to wholeheartedly serve him in that vocation, as diverse as it is here, as diverse as every single one of us is different in our life and circumstances. Okay, so Richie, you got two different colors of cakes coming. And you got to take a bite of each one. Okay, you got to have a slice of the white of bright moments. You got to have a slice of the chocolate representing trials. And inside the cake, both are swirled together because this is more likely actually our experience. Um, yes. Okay, at this time, I want to invite Charlie Nelson to come on up here. So, Charlie is undisputably the patriarch of our church. Uh, long-time member of Grace Bible Chapel, Chapel, pastor for, I think, 11 years, going back quite a number of years now. Someone want to get me the wireless handheld mic for this man? Levi had it. Yeah, bring that up here. So I asked Charlie to come up, who knows Richie well, and I asked Charlie to just take a few minutes and speak to Richie, give him some encouragement and um, some sort of charge from our patriarch here as we set you out. Thank you, sir. Big hand of applause for this guy, please. this on? I could just say ditto to what Pastor just said, and amen, and we could go forward. I have an announcement. My wife and I are great-grandparents again. Adrian and Becky had a little boy this morning. (laughs) Richie, I want to share some verses with you from 2 Timothy, and it's when Paul talked to Timothy Timothy was going to take over the ministry in Ephesus. And uh, I want to read some verses and then just give you four phrases. Paul says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit God gives us does not make us timid, gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord and of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. It's now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And the phrase that I want to leave with you out of there says he has saved us and he has called us to a holy life. And when you are ordained, it's a step up in your responsibility to live the gospel, to be an example to those around you, to your family to the ministry that you have, to the people you have. It's a, it's a step up in your calling. It's like if you go back to 1 Timothy, uh, Paul says the elders have to be held accountable because they're named and stepped up. And so that's the first thing. You're called to a holy life. Dropping down a little bit, he says, What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. 
Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Pastor just mentioned that you uh, had to write out testimony or calling, an exam on your doctrine. That's what Paul is talking, talking to Timothy about. He says, guard the good deposit, that responsibility that you have before the Lord to keep the faith. Later on, Paul says, I have kept the faith. What is the faith? It's that body of truth that we have, of doctrine. And so that's the second phrase. First is live the life. Second is guard the deposit. The second two phrases are over in chapter 4. Paul says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his peering and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season, out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, and instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all the situations. In their hardness, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. And the phrase here I want to draw your attention to is preach the word. Now, oftentimes we find people that have an idea of what they want to say, and then they pull verses to back up their idea. No, preach the word. What does God say? Just preach the word. And uh, that's that deposit you take with you. Preach the word. The second phrase is a little bit louder later on, and it's, it sounds kind of weird in the way he says, but it's just keep your head. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. What's it mean to keep your head? It means to keep your focus. Stick with what God has called you to. Just keep on doing what you've been doing. Keep your focus. So it's live the life, guard the deposit, teach the word, and keep the focus. And I think the elders are going to come up at this time and, and uh, pray for you. Check, check, check. Okay, and you're welcome to please stay and pray with us. Okay, any elders that were part of um, Richie's examination, come on up and join us. Richie, we're going to have you sit in the hot, speed, hot seat. We're just going to lay hands on you as a symbol of our uh, setting you apart to this task. And um, I'll ask maybe one of these guys if they want to pray first, then I'll pray for you as well. Come on up here, guys, get in. And Matt as well, yes, thank you. Who would like to pray for Richie and open us off? I didn't warn them about this in advance, so we'll see who's ready to go. We'll give it to Ross. I, yeah, good idea. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are, what you've done, and what you're going to do in through Richie and his family. Lord, we lift them up to you. We realize that this is no coincidence. We realize from you that it is a gift that you've uh, given to him, and he is faithfully executing that. He takes this serious, and uh, it's for you and your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that your spirit would fill him, would encourage him to do the work that you've given him to do faithfully and to your glory. We thank you for this opportunity that we have as a body, each and every one of us here at Grace Bible, that we can come behind them and alongside them and encourage them and strengthen them. We pray for Robin and the family. We thank you for them the way that you've worked in their life, too. And we recognize, Lord, that we are just humble people, needy people. And as we look to you, you give us everything we need. So we pray your blessing upon him, that he would look to you, they would look to you, and they would continue to desire to glorify you through your word, your truth, and that uh, he would continue to feed upon that for your glory as he does his work, Lord. And we know that you're going to bring people to you through your son, Jesus Christ, because of what he does. We thank you for that, and we look forward to the opportunity that we have as a church to come alongside those people, to disciple them, 
and to further your work. So we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm. Father, we dedicate Richie to your service. We pray you fill him with your spirit. Equip him, Lord, with everything he needs. And we pray that you will hold him close to Jesus for the rest of the days you give him. Uh, We set him apart and ordain him to this gospel ministry right now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right. Well, I want to, first of all, say thank you for everyone here for your support and your kindness and your graciousness for all the years that uh, I've been a part of this church. A wonderful family, wonderful church family, and I'm excited to see what the Lord's going to continue to do in and through each and every one of us as we glorify him. Uh, I just wanted to share just a little bit about this journey. Uh, It started, I would say, in Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. In 2010, 2011, somewhere around the end of 2010, I had this desire to learn more of my Lord and Savior. Uh, I was working as a plumber pipe fitter. That's what I planned on doing until I retired. Nothing more, nothing less. I just wanted to work with my hands, uh, what the Lord had for me. In 2011, he just put a uh, desire in my heart to learn more of him. And so that took me going to school at Liberty University online, and I started for an AA in religion. And I did that, and I started, and I was feeling excited about that. In the next few years, the Lord used that time to uh, go to a couple uh, small mission trips through Grace, uh, Charlie was one of them. He led both times. And we also went to a few other countries. And I really started getting missions, uh, mission-minded, mission-focused, sharing what the Lord had in, in my heart and be able to share with others. And about 2015, we were going to make this, uh, we're, we really wanted to make the next step, me and Robin and the boys and the entire family. And so we thought, what's that going to take? I was almost done with my studies. And uh, the Lord, when he calls us, he calls us, but it doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. And so I had 2011, I was going to school, 2015, I'm almost done with my Associate of Arts, and I had six credits left, and there were math credits. I hate math. I hate algebra. I I never wanted to do it for a degree, and I said this, I wasn't going to. I was 10 weeks in a 16-week course, and I quit. I had had enough. I was tired of sitting in the room, tired of doing hours on end for algebra, so I quit. Didn't look back. Uh, the Lord didn't call me to be algebra teacher. So, so I walked away, and I didn't think about it for an entire year. 2016 came, and missions was focused. We wanted, we joined Crossworld. We're going to be on missions. And the next thing is like, well, this thing could serve a purpose, and it could glorify the Lord. So I said, all right, Lord, I'm going back. But when I went back, uh, not only did I have to take the math class all over again, so I had to do the 10 weeks I previously quit, but then I had to do it again. So he was right in that 26 weeks of math, but I upped the ante. Uh, instead of going for my associate of arts, I chose that the next step would be for a bachelor's. So not only did he get me to do my associate of arts, but I put another 60 credits on it. I thought, well, this is good. So we uh, headed out. I continued to study, I should say, and we, I got done almost to 2019, and I had accomplished that goal. I graduated with a bachelor's in biblical and theological studies and a minor in Christian counseling. And I was excited about that because that was what the Lord had me go, and I feel like it was really what he was impressing on me to do. 2019, me, Robin, and the boys, we, uh, we packed up. We headed to Haiti. We'd been there a couple times before that. We're doing full-time missionaries, and this is where we're going to spend many, many, many years, many years. We got there 2019, and it seemed like it was going well. And just a few things come alongside, the ups and downs. Remember that cake? Yeah, that was kind of like the algebra, ups and downs. Things weren't going according to what my plan was or my purpose, I thought. Uh, In 2020, because of various reasons, we ended up having to come back home. Not sure how long that would take. I thought, well, I got a little time. I got a little bit of time, so... The Lord impressed me, why not go back to school? So of all things, so I said, okay, so I joined again. I thought, I'll go for an MDiv. And, uh, and I changed it to chaplaincy, but I didn't know at the time. So I jumped full speed ahead, uh, full time. And then the Lord called us back. We went back to Haiti, and we stayed there until the end of uh, our summer of 2021. He called us back home. And at that point, I thought, well, what does the Lord have? I mean, this up and down, I wasn't sure what was going on. As soon as we got back, I thought, well, I need to find some place where I feel the Lord is impressing on me. And I wasn't sure what that would be, and I didn't feel like plumbing was it. So I said, well, there's got to be something else with the Lord. I looked in the, uh, online, and there was this hospice, hospice chaplain job. 
I've never served in that capacity before. I've ministered with people. I've shared with people. I've been overseas, but I've never shared, never been in that kind of a situation. So I thought, well, I'll just go give the world. I applied, uh, wondering, not sure how it uh, pan out. They said, well, we'll tell you in a couple weeks. Uh, they called me within two hours, and they said, well, the job is yours if you want it. So I thought, there you go, Lord. So there, there I, so in 2021, started the chaplaincy, or hospice chaplain, and now I fast forward today. And here's where we are, here's where it's been almost two years as a hospice chaplain. I just uh, graduated uh, as, with my MDiv uh, and in chaplaincy, and now this ordination, this wonderful ordination to continue to see where the Lord has brought me. And my charge to each and every one of you, whether you're in high school, just graduating, or if you're older in life, maybe whatever the profession you've been doing, don't ever say you're too old or don't ever say, don't ever look down the line and say, well, this is where it's going to be because I'm, and then fill in the gaps. Remember when I started this journey, it was in 2011, I thought I was going to uh, be a plumber forever. And then 2023, the Lord is still working. The ups and downs, the ups and downs. And I wanted to read two verses that would really uh, explain and really uh, share my heart with uh, the first one is to train and uh, teach. And this is in Ephesians chapter 4, 11. It says, It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does his work. We're committed to one another. We're committed to learn the Lord with one another and grow up with one another into his image. That's, that's his goal. That's his desire for each and every one of us. And then I got, if I ever choose, or if the Lord, I should say, calls me to pastor, I'm not sure. I have no idea. But this right here is where I go to, and this is a Second Peter chapter 5. This is important here. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Serving as, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. We are to grow in one another, and at the end of the day, the Lord gets the honor, and he gets the glory, and he gets the praise, and we all say, Amen.